let me remind you one more time about my new blueprint for success. It's a project I've spent months and months working on just to help you jumpstart your comedy career and beat the competition. Whether you want to do stand-up, sketch, improv, acting, writing, producing, directing, radio, social media influencing, or even if you want a career behind the scenes as a manager or agent, Blueprint for Success will give you all the tools you need to take your career to the highest levels. With exclusive interviews, my top 50 commercial-free episodes from Industry Standard, one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, and unprecedented access into my knowledge and experience from over 40 years in this crazy business. I guarantee you that with Blueprint for Success, you'll become the creator you've always dreamed of becoming. No one's asking me to do this. I want to do it because I want to help you become truly undeniable. So just go to BarryCats.com, click on Blueprint for Success, and start your incredible journey today. I truly can't wait to work with you to help you change the trajectory of your comedy career forever. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Industry Standard with me. Barry Katz, hope you're having a great year, a great month of April, and uh, the best is yet to come. I know that for sure. Uh, I just want to let you know that I am always forever grateful for all your support. You guys are incredible. All your messages, letters, FedExes, um, social media, DMs, it's, it's crazy, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And if you want to reach me, you can do so at Barry Katz at Instagram or X, Twitter. Uh, you can also reach me at my website at BarryKatz.com. Or else you can see this recording and video on my YouTube channel. Just go there and subscribe and you'll get all of these incredible interviews with these great people that you'll be able to watch. I'm really excited for my guest, Graham Dagoni. This is a guy who's really, really special created the magnetic pouches that protect a phone-free environment in venues across the world. He really, really is an innovator and really took great chances. And I know you're going to like this podcast a lot. When I think of Graham, I think of a guy who started as a professional soccer player, an amateur soccer player, and always was all about athletics and then when his athletic career ended he really didn't have a direction and was working many many jobs that he couldn't stand and it's fascinating how fate works where one day he sees something happening where somebody's being filmed and he feels it's unfair that they're being filmed that way and comes up with the idea of yonder and figures it out and puts whatever money he has into it and developing it and literally has everything in a van and just trying to figure it out through there, barely having a way to live or to eat based on all the investment that he's putting into this idea that he has that nobody else is doing, but believing in himself and believing in the concept when a lot of people didn't. And that's the challenging thing about our world in terms of our creative lives. We have to bet on ourselves. We have to fight for ourselves. Because if we don't fight for ourselves and our ideas, who else is? We're the ones that care about them the most. And the other people care about them secondarily. Even when they believe in us, they don't believe in us as much as we initially believed in what we wanted to do. And the thing about Graham that's so exciting is that he changed what he was doing. He completely did like a 360 or a 180 or whatever you call it, where he just completely flipped the script. And did something completely different that wasn't necessarily in his wheelhouse and then 
caught the attention of great people. People like Chappelle, people like Kevin Hart, people like Chris Rock, people like Bill Burr, people like Joe Rogan, people like Amy Schumer, Madonna, Lady Gaga. These are these are the greatest creative minds in entertainment of our lifetimes. And whenever you do anything that you're working on, you have to make sure it's extraordinary and great. Because when you do that, then extraordinary and great people notice. And then they want to work with you. And then once one of them works with you, it snowballs. And then the other wants to work with you. And before you know it, you're going to get to the place you always knew you could get to and want to get to. And I can guarantee you, if you follow that philosophy and you do things that way, in a smart way, in a way where your belief in yourself parallels and mirrors the way you develop what you're doing and the way you put what you're doing out in the world, I can guarantee you, you're going to have the possibility of having the kind of career that Graham Dagoni has. Here we go in three, two. I got everybody pregnant with Barry Katz and Seaman. I'm not comfortable with the tone this is taking. If you're undeniable, you will not be denied. If you want to be successful in show business, you get yourself a Jew white manager like Barry Katz. <laughs> Being a manager is just turning no's into yeses. Creating holy shit moments. Uh, undeniable. You're fucking firing me up, Katz. I love this man. Is there anything else I should know? You're on. What? Now I'm on the air. Harry Katz, back in the house, house, house. Let's do this. Let's do this. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest today. This is a really special interview. It's unusual. It's not your normal kind of interview because it involves a guy who took risks on the other side of the business in a very unique way. And I'm talking about a man named Graham Dagoni. And so let me introduce him for you, and then I know you're going to enjoy this a lot. Graham Dagoni was born in Portland, Oregon, and is an American entrepreneur and former professional soccer player, as well as, and more importantly, the founder of Yonder. That's Y-O-N-D-R, a company that pioneered the concept of phone-free spaces with its sealed pouches. Dagoni attended Jesuit High School in Portland where he played both soccer and American football as a place kicker. He was a member of the 2004 NSCAA Youth and EA Sports All-America teams and was named to the All-Star team at the prestigious Adidas Elite Soccer Program. He was also a member of the Region 4 Olympic Development Program and Super Y Regional Olympic Development Program teams before going on to play four years of college soccer at Duke University. But that's not why I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that because it shows you how anyone who has a creative mind can switch in other directions that have nothing to do what they perceive as their greatest talent. Dagoni became a professional soccer player for a few years and then moved to Atlanta where he worked unhappily for a mid-size investment firm and for the first time in his life sat at a desk for eight hours a day. Later, he relocated to the Bay Area, spent a few months working at various startups, but he hated that too. After attending the Treasure Island Music Festival in 2012 and witnessing a drunk concert goer being recorded by onlookers without his permission, Dagoni started questioning technology's impact on freedom of expression and started researching sociology, phenomenology, and the philosophy of technology. Dagoni later founded Yonder in 2014 after experimenting with several different options. He then designed the Yonder Pouch, 
which has a magnetic security tag that can be unlocked with a proprietary device. Dagoni later visited schools around San Francisco to promote the pouch. Since the invention, many artists, school districts, and even courthouses have utilized it. But most importantly, one of the greatest artists of our generation, Dave Chappelle and his team recognized the importance of it. And Dave became the first comedy client of Yonder. And after those concerts, the rest is history. Yonder has been used around the world in music concerts and all forms of entertainment. It's been used with some of the greatest artists that you can ever imagine, including Kevin Hart, Chris Rock, Bill Burr, Tracy Morgan, Amy Schumer, Colin Jost, Jack White, Madonna, Bob Dylan, Lady Gaga, and Joe Rogan, just to name a few. I'm honored to introduce my guest today. I know you're going to love this podcast. If you can just get down and understand and relax and absorb it like I did. Please welcome my guest today, Graham Dagoni. Thanks for having me, Barry. How you doing, boss? I'm fantastic. I'm excited about today because uh, I don't normally get a chance to interview people on the other side of the business. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of questions I have for you about your groundbreaking company, Yonder. Mm -hmm. And um, the first question I have out of the gate is, what was your second choice for a name? <laughs> oh, what was the second choice? I don't know. When I was first starting the company, I realized you can look around any room pretty much and pick anything and it's taken. So I think the second choice was something to do with focal points, focal, something like that. Um, something around the idea of gathering people into a shared space. But then Yonder popped up and I think it was a lot better. So um, I have so many feelings about this company and this product. And I have a guy across from me who's all the light. You're the light. You're not the darkness. And all I know is the focal point of artists. I don't know what it's like to be a school and to have students there using it that's not my lane i don't know anything about that all i know is artists mm -hmm. and most artists in order to be extraordinary they normally have like a a streak of darkness within them and sometimes that streak is very very wide and sometimes it's a sliver but you're a guy who's the light you know you sit across from you and you're just it just seems like you're calm, seems like you're stress-free, and obviously you can't be stress-free when you're the CEO of a com company. Mm -hmm. So the first question I have for you is, you come up with the idea, we're not gonna get into the development of it yet, let's just talk about when anybody has an idea, the first thing that they have to do is sell somebody on it. It might be an investor, it might be a family member, it might be an audience, it might be a writer that you gotta sell something, a studio. Mm -hmm. And you, sitting across from you, uh, this is where you jump across the table and strangle me. The last thing that I would think that you were would be an extraordinary salesperson. <laughs> So uh -huh. how did you go about, you got your idea, and we'll talk about the development later. Mm -hmm. You got your idea, you got to go to the first person out of the gate to sell them on this new concept. Who's the first person that takes a chance on your concept? Uh, good question. Um and I think you measured it up right. I don't think of myself as a salesperson either. I never have. Even to start the company, 
and to kind of get into business in any way was for me a very against kind of my nature. Um, but I think the first, you know, I had the idea and I kind of moved from the world of ideas into manifesting things, making things happen, moving stuff, getting out in the world. I think the first person that let me, you know, try it out was at this, uh, was a manager at a place called the Stork Club, which was kind of a biker bar in um Oakland. was that in your hometown or someplace else oh that was in san francisco okay. it was actually it was in uh, oakland across the what bay. kind of a venue was it it was a biker bar and they did um cabaret shows and that's what they let me try it at it was a cabaret show but the cabaret people sing tunes that are already known yeah you don't go to a cabaret and hear original music Definitely not. So why did anyone care about, was it just a test? I mean, you, I guess what I'm saying is, and this is a, this is great, mm -hmm. and I don't want you to stop. Just let me just, mm -hmm. I just want to say that, so you just go to a place to just try out the technology, but when people are going into the venue at this motorcycle bar or whatever it yeah. is, like why are they being told to put their phones in the case for a cabaret show? Well, that was the thing is I didn't, I don't think they knew. And so people did not respond very well. I think what had happened was the manager believed in it. She kind of on a more philosophical level, just talking to me and she was willing to, I think she saw what I was trying to do and give it a shot. But up to that you know, point, I was going every day to eight schools a day by car. I was going to three or four venues every night, driving down to LA, going door to door. So you got several no's. A million no's. Which again, solidifies the fact that you weren't a salesperson. Yeah. Now, if another person that you know that is in sales today at your company, let's take your best salesperson mm. and you go way back and you put your magic glasses on and you say, okay, if that guy went to all those places, how many places would he have sold? What do you think? Probably more than me, because I think <laughs> at the time I was also very stubborn. And so I wasn't, I was figuring out how to meet people halfway with, because everyone's in a different place when you think about technology and its role in society. And I was pretty um, stubborn about what I believed in, in people meeting me there. And if they didn't, I kind of would move right along and I go, well, someone else will get it. And it took me a while to learn how to kind of, um, create bridges for people to, to meet me there. You know? All right. So take our audience through the first stand up comedian that you sold on the concept you don't have to go through all the comedians that passed on you yeah if you don't want to you can but uh but take us through the first comedian you identified that uh said yeah we're gonna take a meeting and then they took a second meeting and how did you get to that point to where they said yes so for our audience i think this is important Take us like 24 hours before you even approach the people. What was your strategy to approach them? Were you going to approach their agent? Were you going to approach their manager, their lawyer, their publicist? Were you going to walk into a comedy club and just run into them and give them one and show them how it works in the back room? So take us through the process of the one that you landed, the first one. Sure. So I think... 24 hours before it would have been at the time I, I was living in San Francisco. I had a 1978 Toyota dolphin camper and, um, that's what I would do. So I would, I would have been in LA. I drove down in that. I camped out on Venice beach in the parking lot. So you were, you, you were homeless. You lived in a van. Ah, I didn't live in the van full time, but that's how I got around and did these business trips because okay. I would stack pouches in there, all my little sales materials. I'd be out there, you know, camping, and I'd drive into a CAA or whatever. But you uh, got the meeting at CAA. How did you get the meeting at CAA? I didn't get the meeting at CAA. Okay. I tried. The first, the way it actually came about is I got a call out of the blue, and I didn't know how they had found out or got my number, uh, but I actually got a call from from Dave's manager, 
uh, Chappelle. Now, does he have a manager or is his agent Rick Greenstein? It was one of his right hand people. Got it. Yeah, who I've come to to know really well over the years. So back and then, I didn't know that he had a manager. I I thought he was you know. I don't know if his title would be manager. Honestly, maybe that's wrong. It's more. One um, of his one of his people. Yeah, yeah. Very and smart. they reach out to you. Isn't it fascinating that you f kill yourself to sell this product? You're like killing yourself and can't get one comedian to buy it. And then somebody calls you because they hear about it. Now, where did he hear about it from? I actually never found out. Still to this day. Still never found out. I think maybe... You know, if you go further back, I did a few little little shows in um, San Francisco after that store club show. And I think one writer had been there, a tech writer, and written a little piece. And maybe that's how it floated up and got there. But Got it. So they reach know. out to you and yeah. you get the phone call. And what do they say? Uh, would like a meeting to discuss it. So I A meeting with them or a meeting with them and other members of the team or them, other meetings, members of the team and Dave or just Dave? Just other members of the team. Got it. So no one, not Dave yet. Right. Okay. So I go to that, have a coffee. Now, now this is a big moment for you because, you know, we got a guy who's obviously one of the four faces of today's Mount Rushmore of comedy. 100%. And you're like, oh, for a thousand in, yeah. in, in selling. Uh -huh. And you're driving up in your dolphin van. I parked that around the corner. Yeah. And you have to go in and you have to sell yourself. Even though they made the incoming call, you can't go in there and lay an egg. So how do you, yeah. how do you prepare yourself to be a different Graham than you've been in the past, how did you know what to say, what to do that would get their attention and say, let's try this? Well, I would say that's the thing is I, I, I firmly believe deep down that I didn't need to change anything, that it was all about the particular artist who actually was thinking about the issues and cared about it and understood it the way I did. And, because I built the thing for artists. And so when I heard it was someone like Dave, I felt very confident that if I just talked to what it was and what it could do and what I believed it could do and was totally honest, that was the best approach. But it's a game of telephone. You're telling the people and then they're telling his people and then they're telling him. And then by the time it gets to him, it's, you know, the ideas about Santa Claus shooting dice in the swimming pool. And you're like, wait a second, I'm, I'm selling yonder here. Of course. No, I, I know. All right. So you meet with how many people? Um, I think it was just one other person. Are you allowed to say who those people are? Oh, I don't know. I'll leave it off for now. Okay, no problem. Yeah. All right. That's okay. Because those people obviously, you know, are a part of history. So, for me, so, uh, but, yeah. that, but that's exciting. So, so where are you meeting? Are you meeting in a Starbucks? Are you meeting in an office? Are you meeting on the street corner? What are you? <laughs> it was really casual. I think it was at a Starbucks. God. And it was a short meeting. And then I think, honestly, three days later, I was back with my, my friend because there was really no team. There's no company yet. I was talking as though there was a company, but it was, you know. How much money were you into it at this point? Not much. Everything I had, I had sunk into pouches enough to do a, sh a decent size. But how show. much was that? Oh, I maybe had you know five thousand, ten thousand pouches, maybe five thousand probably. And how much did like in other words, how much were had you invested in yourself so far? Oh well, when I started out, I sold my car and I had I think seven thousand dollars. That's what I had, and I had that for a long time until I scraped together about a year later. A total of maybe seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars, and that's what you had into it at that point. I would say by the time I met with uh, with Dave's team, that's about what I had into it. Yeah, got it. Okay, so three days later, you get a call from the same people, and what do they say? Uh, they said Dave's doing a run at Talia Hall in Chicago, and he was just coming back on the scene at the time. And um, can you do the shows? And I said, of course. How big was the venue? It was maybe. Maybe 2,000 cap. Got it. So when you're doing, you know how like when you, <laughs> you know how when uh, you go to do like, let's say, 
uh, flooring in your house, they always mm -hmm. say, okay, uh, we got 2,000 square feet, and you go to order 2,000 square feet, and they say, no, 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 you got to order 2,200 square feet. Yeah. Like, why do I got to order 2,200 square feet? Because you got to have extras just in case. So, mm -hmm. so 2,000 means you got to have 2,200, plus if there's two shows in one night, you got to have 4,400. Exactly. And this was a stretch of, I think it was eight shows in a row. It was a residency. It wasn't just one show. But I mean, yeah, you, but for the one night, you can't just have turn over the 2,000. You have to have double. Exactly. Plus 10% more, correct? Right. All so right. I'm taking all the inventory out of the public storage unit I've got in uh, where all the inventory is. How many do you have? Oh, like I said, probably five, maybe 6,000. Enough barely to cover the shows. But he didn't know that. Of course not. <laughs> no. All right. So... The next thing is, so you got the sale. How did you know what to ask for financially? If I look back at those things, I, I didn't have a clue. I just cobbled together some stuff. I just knew that if we did the shows and uh, it, look, there's, there's risk involved, but there's no risk when you're trying to start something, get off the ground. There's only opportunity. So for me, I think the first check I got was, I don't know. It was first show was maybe I charged five hundred dollars or something like that. Yeah, so you charged five hundred dollars for a two thousand seat venue. Yeah, something. But like this that. is the hardest thing that's amazing about what you're talking about, and for those of you in the audience, this is the toughest part as an entrepreneur. You always want to give somebody a great deal in the yeah. beginning, and then you give them the great deal, and then you tell them what it's really going to cost, and then they're like, "Mother, it was five hundred dollars <laughs> for two thousand. Why is it 10000 for 10000 Yeah. Well, because we, you know, well, that's not cool. Can you give me a break? Can you do what? It, and it doesn't matter how wealthy you are as a person. You don't want to be in a situation where you feel like. It's like if the cleaning person, if you have a cleaning person that you hire once in a while, they come and and they say, I'm going to do a break for you. I'm going to do it for $100. And the next time you hire them, they, they say it's going to be 200 You get a little, you get a little antsy. And so, and so was there a problem jumping up to the price you needed to get? There, there wasn't. I mean, there are things I've learned over the years. This, this was 10 years ago, but I think I was very, very, very fortunate with the people. You know, I was thrust into the comedy world and thrust in to, you know, with the team and probably one of the best comedians, greatest comedians of all time. But they were very supportive and fair and understanding i think they understood more about where yonder and i was than they let on got it and yeah. so this is something that's fascinating like today for those you know in the audience you don't know this but today like i'm back in the studio for the first time in like three months i haven't been here in a while and i get here in the morning and and presume i can have enough time to make things work to where we start at a certain time but instead we started 22 minutes late which is horrifying because uh as we all know from vince lombardi uh what is it uh if you're uh what is it if you're early you're on time if you're on time you're late and if you're late don't bother showing up mm -hmm. so uh i almost did one of those george bush things where i <laughs> up the whole quote uh so so you're doing your first big event. The largest crowd you ever did before Dave was how much? Oh, maybe three, 300, maybe. 300. So now Graham has to prove to Dave that he's got his shit together. And he's got to put a team together to execute at the theater. He's got to train the people at the theater of what's going to be happening. You have to train the audience who isn't expecting Yonder. And so the show that's supposed to start at, let's say, 8 o'clock, I can't even imagine that in your first time for 2,000 people, it started on time and everything went smoothly. So tell us how that day went and tell us the ups, the stress, the craziness, and how you got through it where he still wanted to work with you. We were set up outside. I don't think, I, I don't know if I trained the, the staff at the venue effectively as much as just tried to get them to understand and like me, you know, to just work, work with it a little bit. But it was all an experiment. And most of the effort 
I put in was just talking to fans as they came in, trying to meet them where they were and just say, hey, you know, this is a phone free show. You're going to keep your phone. Don't worry about it. You're going to enjoy it a lot more and just get people a little bit on the level. But you had a lot of people, especially at that time. I mean, people had strong feelings about their phones and 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 what that represented. So, you know, there were. I think at that show, I think there was a guy who smuggled his phone in in his underwear, got caught by security, got hauled out. They're going through the guy's pants, and then the cameras. There's news cameras there, and they're filming the whole thing. And the whole thing was like that. It was cr- it was just kind of you know frenetic energy. But overall, I think we pulled it off in a way where it, it worked, where overall nobody kind of really tried to buck it in too hard a way. And at the end, we're sitting there with, you know, 3,000 whatever pouches going through them hand by hand in the back going, well, that seemed to go okay. Let's pack it up and get ready for the next one. But you hired all new people. to You, you, you had people to help you for 300, but now you got to hire, you know, seven times more of the people for one ch- for that show and you got to train them like how do you find those people i mean to start with i just used used whatever ushers or people the venue had in addition to myself and one of my good friends and just tapped people you know i knew and just said hey can you can you help do this and recruited honestly any anybody who who could kind of who we could work with uh, it wasn't until later after the, the day run that then we started to deal with bigger shows, bigger tours, and the more systematic training of it. But at the time, I was doing all the tour managing. You know, if there was a show that came up, it was as I would pack up all the pouches, you know, we needed. We'd double check multiple huge bags on airplanes and fly with them. We weren't we didn't have any sophisticated shipping operation or anything. So it was all just very one at a time and not worried about, I couldn't even think about where it was going from that point. Now, I, I want to talk to you about something that's very difficult for me to talk about sitting across from you because you're such a, a, a wonderful man. You know, you're an incredible guy to be across from. Like I, I feel so safe and so calm and just, I can imagine how everybody feels great around you. Um, because there's this paradox that is in my mind and my the fiber of my body around your product. Mm-hmm. On one hand, I love the product, and I'm so excited that artists can get a chance to protect their work, but not just protect their work. Let's just pretend you don't care about protecting your work. You just want to put on a show where nobody's looking at their phone, sort of like... When I waited in line for 18 hours to see Elvis Presley, there were no phones, mm-hmm. you know, and it was an amazing experience. The other side is, and I say this, and it's a word I rarely use, I hate your company. Because every time I go to a show, it's the most, to me, the most annoying, like I feel like I am cattle just being rustled through a maze of stuff or mice going to get a f***ing piece of cheese. And it's so much extra ugh, to go through when I'm not even the guy who is going to be recording the artist. You know, it's like actually the one, one time when I went to see Dave... Um, and he invited me and my son to see him in New York. I think it was Radio City Music. He actually, uh, I think him and Jeff Wills told me I didn't, we didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. But, but the point is, you still want to have the experience of everybody else. I don't want to be treated. I mean, I'd, I love being treated special, but I still want to know what the experience is. I want my son to have the experience. And I saw so I, and then I went to a show in Vegas where I think Tiffany Haddish was or whatever, and it was just like. And they had the room and the setup and everything, and it was just, and everybody was so nice. But it's just, uh, to me, like, the good is so obvious, and it obviously outweighs the bad for the artists. But there's no, what, what's fascinating about sitting across from you, is you're one of the few people who is the chairman and CEO and founder of a company 
that makes things more difficult <laughs> for the audience <laughs> member than makes it easier for them. Your company makes it better for the artist, but more difficult for the audience member, more challenging, more, more stressful. Um, like you said, your phone is your, you know, thing. Well, you still have it with you in the pouch. Yeah, that's, that's great. But what happens if, you know, the babysitter calls and I need to go here? I'm sure you're going to have an answer for that. Of course. There's a phone number somewhere for an emergency and they'd have your seat number and whatever. But, you know, in the mosh pit, it's kind of hard to find uh, Barbara and Sam, you know, mm -hmm. when their kid's having a medical emergency. But the point I'm trying to make is that you're one of the few people in the world that I know of and if you can tell me one, two, or three companies that are highly successful and make it more difficult for the consumer, I would love you to name them for me because I don't know any. Well, it's interesting. I mean, look, every show is different. Every venue is different. What we try to do is we try to fold into the venue operations as smoothly as we can. Obviously, the goal is to make it as easy as possible for everybody. And you know as well as I do at comedy shows, people show up late. Everyone comes in at one time. You're talking about a big arena show. There's a crunch. And so, you know, the way I think about it obviously is different. I think about and what I'm interested in is I'm interested in philosophy of technology and sociology. I'm interested in what the role of phones and social media and the internet are doing to people, they're doing to artists. And so when we create a phone free space for people, especially around a show, to me, what we're giving them is we're giving people the experience of two or three hours a day without that tug and pull that is slowly hollowing out the meaning in people's lives. And we're, we're giving it to them in the context of and the experience of the most sensitive people in a culture, artists, you know, and that to me is a remedy is a medicine for a lot of what's ailing people in the modern world. So the machinery of how to make it easier and stuff is what we put a lot of effort into and how do we make that continue to make it simpler and easier. But what I find on the other side, you mentioned kind of being shepherded through like cattle and stuff. And that's, a, you experience that Kafkaesque element of the world everywhere, the, the admin of the world, whether you're doing this or that. I feel that in a more acute way, like, when you're forced to go to shows and jump onto a certain app and the apps are tracking you all over the place and you got to do this and that, like that to me is what I, I'm not a huge fan of. And so to me, again, it's cr creating this ground floor experience that everyone can step into and you're just there. You're not worried about the outside world. Your attention is fully there and the artist and the fans feel it. So I got that. Yeah. But getting back to just the heart of the question, uh -huh. Can you name any company where the product makes it more challenging for the audience member than not having it? Oh, well, I think I have to disagree with the premise. I don't think we make so it more So you don't, so in other words, okay, yeah. let's just, just, let's go toe to toe well, with this, course, okay? Yeah. All right. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Madison Square Garden to see mm -hmm. somebody, mm -hmm. whoever it is. Let's say it's Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going without yonder or with yonder. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to tell me that I'm getting into that venue quicker or the same time than I do if I do yonder? I think depending on the day of the week, the artists and when the fans come, it's about the same, maybe fractionally more time. How is that possible? I'm telling you, I've been to thousands of our shows. And it's, I think, a lot of the time, yonder is the quickest part of the entry process. It's security. The optics of it are that a line backs up and that it's yonder. But if you look at it, if you're able to zoom out and look at the line of what's happening, it's it's up near the front of the normal security entry process that's separate from yonder that's the slowdown. I was in Vegas yeah. at this Tiffany Haddish show. And I've been to this theater before to see shows. You have your tickets, you walk in, the usher takes them, yep. See that usher over there? Go to that seat. I'm at the Tiffany Haddish show. There's fucking pipe and drape. There's a whole separate room. I got to go through around this whole thing, mm. through a thing. Here's your thing. It was like, it was like, you can't possibly tell me that it's the same amount of time. How would it be possible? 
I've seen a lot of shows. It sounds like you've had certain experiences. Did you enjoy the show? Of course I enjoy the show. That's not what I'm talking about. That's why I said I love the product for mm -hmm. what it does for the show. I love the product for what it does for the artist. I love the way the feel of the product is, and I love the way it, the technology is. I f***ing love that all, mm -hmm. everything. I f***ing hate the experience going in and going through that craziness mm -hmm. that I've been accustomed to when I've been to a Yonder show. Now, however, I want to say something in fairness to you. I haven't been to a Yonder show since the pandemic ended. Oh, there we so go. So I'm sure I'm sure it's I'm sure it's much better now. Yeah, look, as we grow as a company, you try to get better at everything. Production's one of them. You know, how do you build a production company that does most production companies are promoters, you do certain events in certain places. We're a company that does thousands and thousands of events all over the world all the time. So we're building staffing organizations and all the logistics and supply chain and everything and staff training to span the entire globe. And no one's done it before. I know, and, and it seems, I mean, I'm just being honest, going well, face to face. To, I, you know, if you're running Starbucks and you're Howard Schultz, you know, you have a whole thing. You go in, people go in, they're training the people in the thing, and, and then that Starbucks starts, and there's a manager yeah. there. And that manager is there training people. It's brick and mortar. Yeah. You know, you're doing a show in Paris that somebody wants the stuff and and it's a one off that's right and so how can you ever expect to get the level look you've been in a starbucks these people have day jobs at the starbucks right. <clears throat> baristas yeah and you look at your cup and you're like grant i'm not grant i'm yeah. grant uh -huh. I'm, I'm making a joke because i called him grant in the other room because one of my assistants is grant uh so um you know uh so in Starbucks, it's mm -hmm. like stuff goes all the time and they're trained and they're in a brick and mortar store. You're trying to get people to do a great job on a single shot who you don't know. Nobody knows who these people are. They could be ax murderers. Who knows who these people <laughs> I are? I wouldn't say that. And so how do you, how do you, how can you possibly be efficient with all these shows all over the world? How do you do it? We do it. We have a we have a really good production team, and we have a lot of people that we've been working with for years. So when we go to a city, it's not like these are people we don't know. The majority are people we've worked with before, and and we know who they are. We know what they're good at, and they know most importantly, they know yonder. They know yonder, and they know how to talk about it to people. That's, that's like the like if thing. like if I'm you know, and again, I I was unbelievably humbled and honored to to be able to manage Dave for what eight or nine years one of the greatest in one of the greatest times of my life and my career I mean just as much of a genius as yeah. he is now I sincerely tell you was a genius then uh I think to myself it's not even the appropriate time to say it but I think of something he did one of the first times I saw him when he came to New York, he came into my club, the Boston Comedy Club, and he did this joke, and I'll never forget. And this shows you the mind of this guy. Because in comedy, firstly, it's the premise. If you can come up with an original premise that nobody's doing, unbelievable. Then next step is writing to that premise and make something to that premise so that no one sees it coming. It's like you're putting a thousand piece puzzle in front of them and they're never going to figure it out before you get to the punchline. This was the joke. This is how, what a genius he was then and what a genius he is now. He said, I was just in Washington Square Park. I found out that in the old uh, days, uh, um, because of uh, racism and segregation, they used to hang white people and black people on different trees. So that's the premise. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking when he said that in the club, I remember being in the club, I'm like, where can he possibly go with this? And he said, can you imagine the black people picketing in the park 
we want to be hung on the same trees as y'all. Mm -hmm. That's how brilliant the mind mm -hmm. he is. So if I'm him and I can't speak for him or his team working with you, and as great as it is, I would probably, like if I'm making a movie or a television show, I probably would love to have the same team that worked my show at Radio City Music Hall at Madison Square Garden. And I'd probably like to have that same team do the Staples Center if I do it. And if I go to London, I'd like that team. Do people request the same teams that work with them in Chicago and all over, or is it a whole different group every time? No, of course, there's continuity. Um, we have, uh, you know, in our internal, our full-time staff, we, we try to keep all of that as can as kind of uh, connected as we can. It's not always possible when a show pops up in Paris, like you said, to, to then it's in, you know, Sydney or it's in uh, L.A. So, but yeah, we, you know, people knowing knowing the comedians and the artists we work with and then kind of keeping continuity is important. It's not always possible, but as much as we can following tours and doing that, we found that works way better because then you fold it in with the team. Everyone knows everybody. It just, it builds on itself. So that's something we've learned over the years. And we do with people, artists like, um, you know, Jack White's team, for instance. And, and they've kind of, we've learned from them over the years and great tour managers have taught us the best way to do it. Hey everybody, it's Barry Katz and I wanted to talk to you about Blueprint for Success. This is a community that I put together during the pandemic to help all artists of every walk of life in the entertainment business, no matter where you are in that part of this journey, it's designed to help you. There are podcasts with people that will inspire you like Kevin Hart, Judd Apatow, Bill Burr that you can't find anywhere else but on this program that I've interviewed to times where we get to talk to executives in the business that you would never have access to, to tell you what you need to hear and to answer your questions, to all sorts of different videos and master classes designed to help you get to the promised land. That's what the blueprint for success is. Doesn't matter whether you want to be a stand up comedian, a sketch performer, a podcaster, an actor, an actress, director, writer, social media person, whatever you want to be. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've had the honor and been humbled to represent people like Chappelle, Wanda Sykes, Louis C.K., Dane Cook, and probably over 20 other people who went from a studio apartment to being a multi-millionaire and a household name. And I want that for you. And I wanted to take the time with this program to be able to help you on your way there, to get there and to heighten and increase the trajectory of your career. Blueprint for success is the way to go. I'm proud to be a part of this program and I'd be proud to have you to be a part of it too. The most shows you've ever done on one night in different parts across the world and how many pouches on that one night? Oh, I think for any given night, one particular night? One night. It's probably gotta be, I don't know, 35, 40, um, maybe, I don't know, couple hundred thousand pouches in, in just those events and that's just one part of our business you know that's separate from the education side of the company so it's a lot of logistics incredible yeah. out of out of every thousand pouches made how many are defective <laughs> I, don't, I, I should know that number uh i have a sense for how many we lose at a big show how many get destroyed how do you lose but, them Oh, just destroyed by by people, by people who are usually it's, you know, someone who's upset or maybe had too much to drink, something like that. But overall, we haven't had real issues with defective pouches. Maybe in the early days, I definitely had some bad batches as I was learning the manufacturing game. How many different uh, manufacturers since you started the company have you switched to? Oh, maybe maybe four or five. But in the beginning, you know, I, I didn't know anything about anything. So I just went online. I created a 
fake account base and started talking <laughs> to factories abroad like hey i'm a i'm a company that needs this and just see what you know where it took me it wasn't until later that i met people who actually knew knew you know how to get connected to the right folks you know how in every situation even when you're at the airport there's exceptions Who gets into a show without having to put the phone in the pouch? Well, who are the exceptions? In general? In general. From the yonder side, nobody. If the artist decides they have people that they'd like, of course that's their prerogative because it's their show. So they put a list together, hey, my agent, my manager, my whatever, they don't have to put their phones away. Whoever, whoever they would like because at the end of the day, it's not a it's not a yonder show. My perspective is yonder is a facilitator. We're here to help the artists do what they want to do and give fans a great experience. We're, it's not about us. Got it. And uh, from the business side, at this stage of the game in your company, now is it a is it a cost per person, cost per pouch, um, like? You don't have to tell me the cost, because yeah. you know I know you're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I've already done my research. You're not going to tell me the cost of that. But but I just want to know the system. You don't have to tell me the money. Yeah. But like, so at this stage of the game, is it like you know? In other words, if I'm renting chairs for a wedding, it's going to be a cost for this many chairs, and then if I order. 200 they'll give me a break on the next 200 and if i order another whatever is there a is there some kind of a cost how do you how do you what's the system for billing yeah well there definitely there's some economies of scale definitely so when we do large arena tours or arena shows you know that that changes things but overall you're right it's based on it's basically a per seat basically because that's what you're per sold for. seat or per because you can't you know when when they're asking you to do the job i know this is weird to say but because presumably the people you're working with are selling out every show but we all know that there's certain markets where shit doesn't sell as well so mm -hmm. you, let's say you do a deal with somebody and they i remember a town that was a tough town for artists though when i uh we're bringing people around to those areas. It was Boise. Mm -hmm. And also Miami was a tough town and New Orleans was a tough town sometimes to, for comedy, you know, not as great as, it's not that they're not great towns for, for some reason, comedy isn't the biggest thing in those towns, music is or whatever. So you do a deal with them per seat and then, you know, maybe two thirds of the arena is filled or whatever. What, how do you do it then? It really just depends on how much this is getting into the minutia, but it's how much uh, how much notice we have of what that's going to be, because we try to accommodate artists with where they're at. We understand that they're selling tickets and might sell out, might not. If we have enough time to adjust staffing numbers, stuff like that, then we do it and then we bill on that. So it all comes down to how much lead time. Otherwise, like you said, you're in new markets. You're you're always trying to get staff, train them, prepare. And so there's, you know, like anything else, there's just a time window where you can adjust and then where you can't. Got it. Every business has competition. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I remember reading that McDonald's has like a marketing um, budget of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then Burger King doesn't have any marketing budget. They just open up a Burger King right next to McDonald's. So there's competition everywhere. You go to New York City, there is a gas station on every corner. You go, there's a cafe on every corner. Have you had any serious competition trying to undercut your company with a technology that's just as good as yours but cost them less money per seat? Is there anybody out there trying to take you down? Well, look, there are, there are knockoffs, you know, abroad and things like that, and that's to be expected. I know that's coming. Look, we we created a market, we created the concept of phone free spaces, it wasn't around until yonder. Now it's generally it's understood in the public consciousness. So, 
I think that's that's there. But look, we have a lot of IP protection and we're not, you know, we're going to defend what's ours. But yeah, there's going to be knockoffs. There's going to be things like that. It's more of a mark of success than anything. So, um, but what I think people don't realize or have is, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years in schools and it shows we know what it takes to make it successful. We know what it takes, the type of staff you need, the training. Um, it's not as simple as it seems because you're talking about something that's, again, a very difficult, nebulous issue. And how do you create something that um, everyone can get behind? Got it. I want to go way, 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 way back. Sure. Take me back to your early years. This is a fascinating story, how you grew up and, and what things you were into. And because it, it makes no sense except for the competition <laughs> and the thrill of the competition yeah. um, that drove you in those areas. But tell our audience where you grew up, what was the dynamic socially, economically, and, and uh, what you were doing throughout your early years until you discovered, uh, hey, wouldn't it be great if we put phones in these things and protected people? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give, try to give you a window, I guess. I don't know if there's anything uh, too unusual. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, a great place to grow up. Um, spent a lot of time outside, you know, grew up backpacking and camping a lot, skiing. Um, and most of my life, I was a growing up. I was a soccer player. That's that's what I was into. That's I wasn't particularly studious or anything like that. I was a soccer player. But and soccer players go on the field to win, and they put teams together to win. It's not an individual sport. Oh, definitely. And so guess, there's a lot of parallels there. But also, yeah, you grew up in a very religious family, didn't you? No. Not really religious, no. So didn't you go to like a Jesuit kind of? Oh yeah, I went to I went to a Catholic high school, but which I actually I'm glad I did because it gave me exposure to a lot of the, a lot of new ideas and explains a lot of the reason the world is as it is when you understand you have some basis in Christianity. Um, but to me, I'm I'm not a religious person, but uh, I really, I really appreciated the perspective. But I think, yeah, like athletics, the, the competitive streak and that being in there, that's, there's no doubt. That's like, um, I don't even think about that. That's in there somewhere. I think I've become a little less that way as I've gotten older, or maybe it's mellowed out or leveled out. I view things differently. But there are definitely always expectations. And, and I had high expectations for myself. And it just took me quite a while to figure out how to uh, find out what I was interested in outside of soccer. You're doing soccer, and then what happens is you're one of those soccer players who becomes a place kicker. So now it's an, now it's an indivi now it's an individual game. I did that for a year of my senior year of high school. That was a waste of my Friday nights. <laughs> if I could undo that, I, I probably would. What's the longest field goal you ever kicked in high school? I think it was about 55 yards. Really? Yeah. I didn't even know that was possible in high school. Yeah, yeah. And you never got recruited. No, I was a soccer player. Football was. It not on my radar. But so then you played professional soccer, didn't you? Yeah, first stint I did after after school. Yeah, I had some time in in Norway. I played and then I played one last season. I had picked up a few injuries by then, which actually was kind of what started me down a different path, I would say. Because um, when I got hurt, then I started to kind of, another part of my brain switched on. I started to get into music. And that was what kind of opened up that in like a, that mid twenties kind of drive for self exploration was what kind of opened my mind to other things. And so, when you got injured and you stopped, uh, I think you you were in the investment business or something like that, or in the money business, and um, which is something that's diametrically opposite oh, the, yeah. in the beginning of what you're. Doing. So, why did you get into that business? Well, that was the first real really kind of any corporate job I'd ever had because in the summers in high school and in college and stuff, you know, I worked on like a, I worked on a ranch in college uh, on like a horse farm. I worked on golf courses. I did all those things, but I didn't know professionally at all what I wanted to do outside of soccer. So when I went and worked at this one, you know, finance firm for just a little bit, it was my introduction into the modern work world. And like, um, I had a very, 
I think that was kind of almost like a conversion experience for me because I was looking around at this. I was in a windowless room somewhere on the suburbs of Atlanta, and I was going, this is not it. This is not it for me. And um, that led me down a path of, you know, I kind of explored it more about what that feeling was, what I thought it was, and that led me starting to read certain existentialist writers, and then that kind of just snowballed, and I followed. I just went down that rabbit hole for, honestly, three or so years, and it led, just kept on, kept on leading to other things, and eventually yonder popped out the other side. Um, but it was me just following my interest that all started there. And take our audience through that first germ of what entered your head, what would be this company. I, I believe it, there was a, if I do my research effectively, I believe it was a, a music festival that you attended about 12 or 13 years ago that was the impetus for the company, or am I wrong? Yeah, that was kind of the experience, like in a hyperbolic way of what was happening and how people were a using A hyperbolic music. way, I like yeah. that. Okay, got you it. You know what I mean? Yes. But it was that... My yonder, my whole worldview is wrapped up in yonder. It's my whole philosophy of life is in it. So to me, it's more about um, the role of technology in society and the influence of technology. And it's not a new question. It's not new to the Internet. People have been talking about it for hundreds of years, from Heidegger to Kierkegaard, Marshall McLuhan. And those are the things I was interested in, is what my hypothesis was that life is always full. And if something new comes along, it displaces something else. What is that? what's being lost and what's being gained. And so that was my point of departure and a basic general feeling that like simpler is better in most things. Um, but that experience at a music festival of watching someone, um, you know, dancing, they're drunk and being filmed and that being broadcast out to the world. If you dissect that and you think about it in terms of the psychological effect, the social aspects, it's not tenable and that I felt like the tech world and stuff was off on this path that everything was going to get more connected everywhere all the time and somehow lead us to this utopia and I was not seeing that I was seeing things heading in a different direction you know what's really fascinating and this is something that whenever I sit across from somebody I, I just sometimes I never know what's going to come across my mind but I just thought about something that's truly I think it's a truly amazing thing. Go with me here. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody does something, like you said, it replaces something. There's things that change history. Like I watched uh, that JFK um, series, whatever, where he went back in time and he could... You know, he could change the assassination. He mm -hmm. had the power to, to change it, to stop it. But then at, after he stopped it, when he came back to the regular world, it was like an apocalypse. You know, sometimes bad things have to happen for extraordinary things to happen. And so what's fascinating to me is that before your company came to being, one of your clients wouldn't be probably using your service, wouldn't probably be, might not be, it's possible, he might not be as huge as he is now. I don't know because he's so extraordinary an artist uh, that, that, Chances are he, he would figure out a way to break through. But Bill Burr, the only reason that he broke through when he broke through was because somebody in a crowd videotaped him roasting the city of Philadelphia after they tortured him for 20 minutes. Hmm. That went viral, and after that he was selling out every show. It wasn't any funnier than he was when he went on stage. But if Yonder were around then, it could be argued that the tra trajectory of Bill Burr's career would not be what it is today or would have changed forever. So do you ever think to yourself when you're in that existential way that you think of things because you're really a deep, you're like, I look at you as like a thought leader, not like a thought leader 
like you're a motivational speaker, but you have these thoughts and then you put them out there and then you lead the world in a certain area, like this area. Do you ever think to yourself how many artists don't get the break as hard as Bill Burr did because somebody randomly filmed them? Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good question. And honestly, there, that's where I feel like, um, there's two sides of every coin. There's two sides. And I hear it from artists who certain artists will say, look, we like having the social media exposure from a show of people texting and tweeting. And I, I get it. I totally get it. And I get how that could happen. On the flip side of that, you could say Howard Dean might be president if they had used yonder. And that whole outburst back how many years had happened. So there's two there's two parts of it. But what can't be, I think, rationalized away or pivoted around is that this sense of, and let's take comedy, for instance. Like, to me, having people focus on the show, their bit not get out there is obviously, cr it's crucial. But the creative freedom to say what they want and for people to experience it in a holistic way and digest it in context versus it being piecemeal pulled out and digested on the internet and kind of, slapped around until it's like you said broken telephone that's what happens so there's no there's two sides to it but there's a simplicity of creating a phone free space that i think is what it is and it comes with there's some trade-offs but it, there's a power to that you know but i totally get it and we there's the same discussion to be had look we, we work with a lot of courts too courts and certain people have said well people should have visibility into what's going on in the court and be able to record right mm -hmm. a valid argument on the other side, someone's giving witness testimony, they probably have the right to be anonymous. So they don't, it's not a hit job on that person. What's the right answer? That's a question for civil society to me. And it's a good question. It's not Yonder's question to answer, but I've got thoughts, but there's trade offs. And that's that dichotomy, the paradox of it runs through the whole question of technology in daily life. And it's something that's nuanced and it's not, it's not simple to answer, but artists, I think, feel it most intuitively. Six degrees of separation. Six degrees of separation. I'm going to mention some names. Sure. Just tell me what comes to mind. Could be a word, could be a sentence, could be a little tiny story, inspirational, it could be whatever. Chris Rock. Oh, talented. Got it, because you get to see all these people. I've been very fortunate to see a lot of shows. So this is why I'm asking you yeah. from you're the guy on the other side, and and then you get to work with them as a as an entrepreneur and a business person, and you get to observe them as an artist. So it's, that's that's why it's I just the best part of the job is getting to sit in the stands. Fantastic, yeah. Tony Hinchcliffe. Oh. Less touch points. What I've seen, extremely funny. Cool. I'm going to keep going. Madonna. Um, that was a scene. That was a scene. I enjoyed it. I saw a show she did on that tour at um, the Warfield in San Francisco. And I think maybe... It, I can't show, believe she did the Warfield. I know. It was a crazy... And went on about two or three hours late. So the crowd was delirious. It was... It was a total, that part of San Francisco, you know, too, that was a, it was a scene. It was a spectacle. The Lumineers. Oh, that's a blast from the past. I, that, they were early, they were an early band that we worked with. I had great experiences with, with their, with their team. Um, but I haven't listened to him a ton since. Joe Rogan. I, I appreciate what Joe Rogan does. I really, I respect it. So he's been great to work with. Um, and he's funny, but I respect the role he he's he's playing in society. I have a lot of respect for. Amy Schumer. Oh, that's a blast from the past too. I don't know. I've always enjoyed her stuff, but I haven't seen her as many times, to be honest. Kevin Hart. That one was a that was a long time. That was a long time coming for us, I would say. So for me, there's a sense of satisfaction that we get to work with an artist like him because in the early going that was someone i chased for a long time and when we finally got the chance to work with him it was very deeply satisfying that we were able to work with him fenway park and bill burr yeah 
that's that was an amazing experience amazing to see someone like that in a venue like that that you know was it hard listening to the comedy and then the middle of the comedy is like hot dogs get your peanuts here no to me cold just, beer everybody well, i thought it was un unbelievable because you're you're talking about thirty five thousand people all listening to bill burr in his hometown and not a single phone inside it's a ma i thought it was a magical experience bob dylan oh again i feel that's one where i feel very just very lucky very fortunate that our paths in some way have overlapped and i think he i think he's one of those artists who also understands pretty deeply what you, what we're as a business trying to do and i feel lucky that we get a chance to work with him because he i think it, it overlaps well jack white oh jack white is amazing to me he's you know jack white and dave when i think of like an an artist a pure artist th those are the two people that come to mind first and foremost people kind of constantly go back to the well and keep producing amazing things so he's another person who's been really important person in the company's history and i've been really lucky to see a bunch of different shows in a bunch of cities i i think he's amazing an amazing performer awesome Graham Dugoni. <laughs> this is a this is a one word response. Whatever you want. Oh, I think I'm just trying to do my part. That's that's all. That's all anybody can do. You're just trying to do your part. Just doing my part. How do you keep your personal life and the business life all together, knowing that there's so many moving parts that honestly are next to impossible to control you know it's like you can control your company you can control your product but every it's like riding a wave every time you know trying to stay up on the board every time but every place you go, there's a different variable. There's a different drunk person. There's a different person on drugs. There's an there's a different uh, uh, ambulance taking somebody away right now. Like the variables are crazy. Like, you know, you go home, you close the door in your house, you sit down, the remote's there, and not a lot of variables. Yeah. Or if you're with your team in the office, you know each you know each other, you know your your board of directors or whatever. But you know, if somebody says like a Madonna says, "Hey, uh, I've decided uh, three days from now I'm going to do an impromptu performance in London. Um, I want you to do it for me." It's like, I mean, how do you keep it together? I think there's a couple parts to it. The one, the most obvious, is like it's we have an amazing team of people who are deeply passionate about what we do and i think more than anything that's what has allowed us to because you understand the show business how many it's everything it's different than any anything else i've done where things are happening real time real solutions and that's not possible without a big group of people who are down to do that and that's not everybody who are down to live that kind of lifestyle and figure things out but at a personal level i think to me i'm i'm Fortunately or not, I'm not a control freak. So for me, I think I've learned over, I've been doing it long enough, 10 years that as a, just a survival mechanism, I've learned that I, there's a point where your personal energy, you have to cut off in order to keep, you know, keep growing. Otherwise you can go get stuck and you can go down and get stuck in a place you don't want to be. And so I always figured that my perspective on what yonder needs next and where things are going and the cultural movements that i'm interested in will only work if i'm continuing to head it personally in a direction that feels like my perspective is shifting because if it's if it's not you're going to get stuck and left behind so if i'm not growing if the company's not growing and i'm not applying new ideas to how i view things then it's not going to work it's not you know your proudest moment in show business How is moment in show business? Honestly, I, I I mean I would I could tell you that first run of shows with with uh with Dave is obviously up there. It's um 
and being you know him mentioning yonder and his credits for a special i think and and, ta- and and knowing what you know different artists have told me about what it means to them to have the freedom that's probably there but also at some level the very first show i ever did at a, a biker bar in the bay i remember going to and just the sense of thinking something could happen and then knowing deep down that it was going to happen and that something could go there um yeah, that's always stuck with me. Your biggest disappointment in show business and how you used it to fuel yourself to the next level? I think we did a show early on. I think it might have been with Louis C.K. I can't remember. It was somewhere down south um, outside in a small market outside of L.A. or something very early. And it was... Uh, it was a, it was just did not go well. Disaster in terms of staffing, all these things went wrong. And it was, I was unprepared. It was just a new experience for me for whatever reason, different market, different things. And I think I was talking to somebody, an agent who, you know, gave me the business about it and rightfully so. And I think I sat with that for a while and just had to think about, all right, do you take that personally or you just take that as this is, this is what learning is. And I've had the same experiences on the school side of the business we have as a company. But at the time, that felt very important because we were kind of just trying to click over, you know, into the next the next phase. Did you ever get Louis back? I think we have in bits and pieces. Got it. You know, it's tough. I, I, I love, like I said, I, I think there's something really great about what you're doing. And obviously, I have artists that you know that have uh, been given proposals from you, and I, I actually recommend that they do it uh, with you, uh, despite what I've told you today. <laughs> um, but sometimes mm-hmm. a lot of them, they look at the cost, um, you know, and they don't look at it per the date itself. They look, they sometimes add up the cost for like a tour of like a hundred dates, and they're like, "Holy, holy, shit, this." This, this could help uh, with a down payment for the house or this could help uh, my child's edge. That would meant my child's whole education or whatever. So sometimes people weigh, and I think that's your biggest challenge is, is people weighing. It's like the way I look at your product, and you're going to hate me for saying this, but I'll take the risk. It's like when you pull up to a parking meter and you just got to run in the store and you're like, ah, shit, I don't know. No one's going to give me a ticket. And you go in, you come out, you don't get the ticket, and you're like, yeah, I beat the system. I saved money, and I beat the system. But then eventually you're going to get the ticket, and you can pay me now or pay yeah. me later. That, I get what you're saying, and I get it. I would. I, a lot of the artists that I speak to, it's about the energy in the room. It's not just about what negative things can be taken out on the internet. It's about people getting out of that work a day mindset and get this and gotcha and stepping into a space and everyone being on the same wavelength. It, that's the ground floor for a fantastic show. Then it's up to the artist to interplay with the crowd to take it there. But I feel like it's, when you create that space, it's more conducive. And um, that's the deeper layer behind yonder, I think. Got it. Last question. What advice do you have for the young person in the world who's driving around in this dolphin van uh, <laughs> with the samples? Uh, Listen to playing, that <laughs> playing sports, doing jobs he doesn't want to do, and trying to figure out what his calling in life is going to be and to have the unbelievably extraordinary career that you've had. How do you get to that point? I don't know. I feel like I'm very much still on the way figuring it out, to be honest. I don't feel that's how it feels to me. Um, the one thing I, I, I used to read a lot of Alan Watts, it, you know, go through phases of reading different guys. And um, he had one saying that I thought about for honestly, or probably a year straight. It was kind of a, a Zen saying of like, um, if you can't trust yourself, how can you trust your distrust of yourself? <laughs> or something like that so you better just trust yourself and if you think about it long enough you kind of realize there are no other options you 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 must believe in yourself and figure it out and be okay making a lot of mistakes 
but learning by doing. I think I thought about it long enough that there is no other option. Otherwise, you're just taking crumbs here and sticking them onto yourself, and it's not your knowledge. It's not yours, you know? So if you think about it that way, there actually aren't any options. You better just go try stuff out and see what happens. Graham, this has been really, really amazing. I really have had an amazing, tremendous time. You're a, a fascinating guy, and um, and I can see why you're so successful, and I see why so many artists and their managers and their agents and their publicists and their lawyers and their family members and school teachers and school children trust you so much. You're a, you're a good man, and I, I'm, I really, truly honored to meet you. Thank you for having me, Barry. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, brother. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening to Industry Standard with Barry Katz. If you'd like more info on our schedule of new episodes or how to reach Barry through Twitter, Facebook, or email, go to BarryKatz.com. Before you leave, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast. Leave a comment and rate it, even if you think it blows. Thank you for your support and have a great day.